Hello, uh, my name is Matt Turner. I work for Intel, I have for about the last six years, and I focus my time on the shader compiler and our Mesa 3D driver. So in this talk, I'm going to give kind of an introduction to 965 assembly language. Um, I'm going to tell you how it's different from other major GPUs. And as part of that, I'm going to demonstrate some interesting opportunities for optimizations that it allows. Um, and then due to the complexity, show off our method of verifying the validity of these instructions. So this is a talk about assembly language. Um, so I'm going to assume that you have some passing familiarity with something, some assembly language, maybe for CPUs. Um, since you're here, then there's a, maybe a good chance that you have some experience with a GPU assembly language. Um, and even if you don't fall into one of those two categories, you probably know some trivia about some ancient weird CPU and maybe only remember it because of that weird thing that you learned, like delay slots and MIPS or the VAX polynomial evaluation instruction. Um, so I'm not talking about a CPU today, I'm talking about a GPU, uh, and specifically it is the Intel i965 series. Um, that name, i965, specifically refers to a, a GPU that Intel made in 2006, so it's obviously pretty dated, but um, all Intel GPUs since then are descendants of that original core. And even though the instruction set has changed numerous times in those 12 years, the, the core points are still very much the same and it, the assembly language is still very recognizable. But even though I told you that it's, it's going to be different from other GPUs, it, it still does share a number of features uh, with basically all of them. Um, so some common features with, with GPUs are, are, for instance, source and destination modifiers. And that's the ability to set, unset, flip the sign bit of an operand. Um, it supports instruction predication, which is the ability to nullify rights of an instruction. Um, and it also has a unified register file. And I'll explain what that means in just a moment. It also has some less common features. I'm not actually sure what other GPUs have these, if any. Um, and I'm going to try to, to teach you about them through some real uses of these, these features. Um, but first, let me explain a little bit more about the, the common features, just to make sure that we're on the right page. So, 965 has 128 vector registers. And they are, they're 256-bit registers. Um, they can be accessed with multiple types. So, for instance, one could hold eight floats or four doubles, um, 16, 16-bit words. And the, the unified keyword there means that the same registers are capable of holding that different data. So for instance, you could perform uh, an addition instruction on floats and then in, in the next instruction just access that result as if it's an integer. Um, for instance, on x86, you would have to move to and from different register files. Um, the, the source modifiers that I mentioned before, they're going to be written as a minus or an uh, ABS in parentheses in front of an operand. Um, that just is setting or unsetting the, um, the, the sign bit of the, the value in that register. Um, there's also sort of a, a destination modifier, which is saturate, and, and what that does is it clamps the result of an instruction to the range zero to one, and that's going to be written with a, a dot sat on the instruction mnemonic. Um, and uh, the last one is the instruction predication, which is written as a, a conditional in front of um, the instruction. And it uses a special flag register. We have a couple of, of special registers for this purpose. So to whet your appetite, this is 
uh, the fragment shader that implements the, the GL fixed function pipeline for GLX gears. Um, it's obviously pretty simple. There are only five instructions there. Um, it interpolates some components of a color, four of them specifically. Oh, and I see we're, we're losing the first letter. The, uh, the instruction mnemonics up there are, are PLN, and that maybe unsurprisingly uh, stands for plane. It calculates uh, a plane equation, which is the interpolated uh, result. And then the last instruction is a send. And um, below the send, let's see if I can aim this, we have a, a render target write. And so what that means is it's actually just writing out that, that data to uh, the render target. Um, so you, you might have been able to guess what this program was doing if you saw that it, it came from GLX gears and maybe knew something about how the program worked. Um, and you could probably pick out those instructions and you would be able to easily look them up in our documentation. But these, these values in these angle brackets, I would be willing to bet that no one would have a reasonable guess what in the world those mean. And the reason that they exist is because 965 is pretty different. And, and I, don't, I don't mean that it's, it's different from CPUs. I mean that it's, it's different from other GPUs. And of course, GPUs are going to be different from CPUs because they're satisfying a different set of requirements. Um, but the interesting thing is that most GPUs today actually look like they're scalar, even though they're designed to execute these massively parallel programs. Um, the high-level languages that we, we program GPUs in sort of run under this, this model called single, single program multiple data. Um, and in that model, you're, you're writing code that appears if it's, if, as if it's scalar, but then is behind the scenes executed on many, many, many different cores in parallel. Um, and that's really nice because compilers are very good at scalar code. Vectorizing has always been a difficult problem in compilers. Um, but even though you're, you're operating on this, this vector thing behind the scenes, it, that's, that's even below the level that you're, you're generating code. The, the compiler doesn't need to know about the size of the, the vector register. Um, but in contrast, 965 really looks like AVX2, which is a, a SIMD instruction set for x86. Um, it also has channel masking, which makes um, using this kind of code on this kind of uh, architecture work a whole lot better. Um, but it does expose the, the vector nature of the, the instruction set to the compiler writer. Um, and so, for instance, the compiler writer has to consider things that you otherwise wouldn't, like cross-channel interference. Um, but it does offer some interesting opportunities for optimizations and some additional flexibility. So let me show you what a basic instruction looks like. So they're going to be written with uh, an opcode opcode mnemonic, and that'll be something like a, an add or a multiply, followed by an exec size. And that number is the number of channels that the instruction is going to execute on. So that's the width of the, the vector that it's operating on. Um, following that are the operands to the instruction, and uh, note that the destination comes first. Um, all of those Operands are going to include a, a register number and a sub-register number and uh, a register file. And, and the, the normal one is the general register file, which is just noted as G. Um, there's also a type. Um, and this is a little odd, you might think, because the, the add operation that you perform for a float is, is obviously very different than the add operation that you perform on an, an integer. Um, but it internally decides what to do based on the types of the operands and not on the, the opcode itself. So some common types for, uh, for the operand data types are F for float, D for 32-bit double word, and 
for integers, you can put a, a U in front to make it an unsigned value. Um, and then those, those stride parameters, those are going to describe the, the manner in which the register is read. But before we get into that, let me show you what a real instruction looks like. So this is just an add. Uh, it's going to add eight floating point numbers in G5 with the eight floating point numbers stored in G6 and store them in G4. Um, that's not particularly complex and it, it also matches basically exactly an AVX2 instruction. Uh, and visually it's gonna look something like this. And and so here we've got x0, x1, x2, x3. In the, the high level model in say GLSL, those are, are all going to be the same variable, just different instances of them. So maybe um, in a fragment shader, those are going to be consecutive fragments or something. Um, so one of these columns we, we call a, a channel. And so the x0 will be added with the y0 and stored in z0, which is the, the register g4. So that stride, it's not actually a stride, it's, it's more complex than that. Um, it's what we call a register region. And to be honest, if, if MIPS is remembered for delay slots and alpha is remembered for not having byte access, then register regions are what 965 should be remembered for. Um, the destination only has a single stride parameter and that just allows you to jump over components when uh, it's, it's being written. Um, but the, the sources have multiple parameters. Uh, they're, they're called the vertical stride, the width, and the horizontal stride. And, and sort of the, the notion behind this is that the register file is this large two-dimensional rectangle of memory and the strides allow you to access it in interesting and strange ways. So for instance, um, an add instruction. This is you know, the same operation as, as we had before in the previous example. Uh, one difference is that we're only adding four components instead of eight, and, and that's just for simplicity of the example. Um, in this case, we're actually going to read this component twice, and so the X0 and X1 channels are going to read the same value. And then similarly for X2 and X3, uh, they're going to be added to these channels in Y, and then stored in alternating channels in the destination. And you'll notice that the, the pattern of this source and this destination are the same, the alternating channels. Um, the strange thing is that for sources it has to be written like this and for destination it only has to be written like that. Um, so for the same thing you have to do it differently if it's a, a source or a, a destination. So that's a little bit complex um, and it's definitely not intuitive. It took me a long time to sort of get a, a nice grasp on what register region, regioning really means and how to work with it. But I've, I've figured out um, sort of a nice way of describing it. So even though the, the numbers are written as, or the, the parameters are written as VWH, vertical width, or vertical stride width, vertical, uh, sorry, horizontal stride, it's best interpreted by reading them backwards. Um, and so what it's, it's really doing is it strides horizontally to read a width number of channels, and then after it does that, it strides vertically and repeats. So, for instance, that, that G6 register from the, the previous example, it has a vertical stride of four, width of two, and a horizontal stride of two. So starting at the, the low float, it's going to read a channel, it's going to stride by two, which is the horizontal stride, and now it has read two channels, which is the width, and then starting again from 
this original location, it will stride four, that's the vertical stride, and then it will, it will repeat the process up to four, which is this execution size. So you can actually do some, some pretty complex things with this. But the good news is that even with all of that flexibility, we use very little of it. There's only maybe three regions that are commonly used. Um, and, and those are the, the 881, which is just read every channel consecutively. Uh, there's a, a 010, which is like for a uniform, if you want something to be read and accessed by every single channel, just the same. Um, there's also some sort of weird warts of this design where equivalent regions can be described with different parameters. And most frustrating is the, the myriad of restrictions on what you can do. Um, there are really a lot of them and they are complex and difficult for a human to comprehend in a way that allows you to look at an instruction and just decide if it's actually legal. So let me move on to some actual examples of, of real code. So this is how we convert a, a Boolean value to a float. Um, and this is pretty easy. Um, we represent true and false as all ones and all zeros. That's just our canonical representations. And we, we want to uh, produce a result of 1.0 float for true and zero for false. Um, and so what we do is we read that Boolean value as an integer, which will interpret it as negative one for true, zero for false. We use a negation source modifier, which will flip the negative one to a positive one, and then we do a type converting move to actually convert it into a float. So that's just a, a, a pretty simple combination of a couple of features in order to implement something real. So here's another thing that's a little bit more complex. So let me, let me give some background. Um, GLSL has a built-in variable called front-facing. It's a, a Boolean and it just indicates whether or not the primitive that is being operated on is facing the camera. Um, and that information is provided to the shader in what's called the thread payload. And it's, it's some data that gets put into registers by some fixed function hardware uh, before the, the, the shader actually begins executing. And the thread payload contains this bit called backfacing. Um, and it's in, it's in some bit 15. Um, so it contains the opposite of what we need. So a, a naive implementation of, of GL front facing would be to do a not instruction to flip the bit shift it up to the, the sign bit with a, a left shift by uh, 16 and then an arithmetic shift right, and yeah, that's, a, that's an, an ASR over there, uh, by 31 to replicate the bit through. Um, but again, because this hardware supports some weird stuff like mixed type operations, we can take advantage of the fact that the bit just happens to be in bit 15 and realize that that's actually the, the sign bit of a word. And so if we read that value as a word instead of a, a double word, then we can actually just cut it to two instructions. Um, so we, we're still flipping the, the bit, but then we read it as a word and then right shift by 15 to replicate it through the, the low 15 bits and then sign extend to a 32 bit type which will extend it into the high bits. Um, but I saw this and I, I came up with this at some point and was a little bit frustrated that I still had to have that not instruction. And it was a little bit frustrating to, to find out that the hardware gave you the exact opposite of what, uh, what the APIs wanted uh, and you had to emit extra code in order to, to actually produce that value. So I thought, okay, well, it's in the sign bit, and if you negate it, the negation is always going to flip the, the, the high bit, except for in one case. 
which is where that word reads as all zeros. And so for that, I went to the documentation and found out that it just so happens that the, the low bits in that word indicate what the, the primitive type is, and zero is not a possible value. So as a result, we can just combine those three things and put a source modifier on that operand, and so the negate will flip the high bit because we know that it can't be zero. We do the arithmetic shift right to fill the low 16 bits, and then we sign extend to produce the, the high bits. So instead of three instructions, we're down to one. So another, another kind of interesting case, um, the, the sign function. This is S-I-G-N. Um, it returns a positive 1.0 if X is positive and a negative 1.0 if it's negative and zero for zero. And so that, that formulation as it's written there um, will produce this code and it's unfortunate that it's cutting off the, the first column. Um, but this is just the code emitted from a, a basic if ladder doing that. So the, the first instruction is a compare against zero and there's this suffix here, the, the G, compare for greater than zero. And if that's true, then it moves 1.0 float into uh, 127. And, and then I was, I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised to find out that the compiler was able to get rid of the, the second bit of control flow. Um, I think this is sort of a recent addition, but anyway, it compares for less than zero, it, it does the, the bool to float that we, we saw earlier, and then um, gets rid of the, the second bit of control flow with just a single additional instruction. But regardless, that's, that's a bunch of instructions for something that's supposed to be pretty simple. Um, and since we have this unified register file, we can just access the bits directly and do what we want. So this is the way that we currently implement it. We, we do an and, that's an and, and instruction on our input value uh, to extract the sign. So now we, we have produced either a negative zero or a positive zero. And then uh, based on this predicate here, produced by comparing for uh, not, not equal to zero, we or in the binary representation of 1.0, which is the, the magic number here, hex three F eight. So instead of having a bunch of control flow and I don't know how many, seven instructions or something like that, we have, we've done it in three. Um, but this, uh, NZ suffix here. This is called a conditional modifier. And that specifies to the instruction what comparison operation should be done. And implicitly, it compares against zero. And basically, all instructions are capable of doing this. So, for instance, if you were going to take the sign of the result of an ad, it would, it would look like this, but you could actually just move the conditional modifier back onto the add and get rid of the compare. So now in only two additional instructions, you have produced your, your sign result. Okay, so this is a, an image rendered by an integer multiplication test in Piglet. It's obviously not a very complex image, but it, you know, it does more than a, a typical Piglet test, which just draws green. Um, and so the, the code for it looks like this. And again, this isn't a very, very complex program, but you see that it has all of these, these different these different types, it has immediate values, it has um, four or five different operations, it does some operation with a, a, a larger than expected execution size, it uses regioning, this is actually a, 
an unsigned word to float conversion. Um, there are source modifiers. So in only like 12 instructions, we've used more than about 10 architectural features. Um, 965 really does have a lot of different knobs. And, and what's worse, there are a lot of restrictions on them. Um, I've already mentioned that there are lots and lots of restrictions on the regioning parameters, but there are also restrictions on the source modifiers, on the operand types, uh, where you can use saturate uh, and conditional mod, and a lot of those are per instruction. Um, and then if that wasn't enough, the restrictions change per generation. So it's, it's really hard to keep track of these things. And so again, for a human, it's really not simple to look at a program that's maybe failing or causing a GPU hang and verify that you haven't violated any of these restrictions, which is the sort of typical behavior of the GPU when you do violate a restriction. And so I've been working on the compiler for six years, and I'm, I'm telling you that I feel this way. And so I, I sort of feel sorry for people that, that have to jump in without a whole lot of support and try to debug something. I can't really expect anyone to do better than that. So my solution to this, after seeing some people struggle on debugging a problem, was to just write a validator. Before we submit code to the GPU, run it through a validator. Check a bunch of things. So right now the validator uh, that I've implemented checks about 50 restrictions in total. There's about like eight different classes of problems. There's still a bunch more things that we could test. But I focused on testing register regioning, which is the, the easiest thing for a human to miss. Um, I don't ever want to have to debug another problem with that ever again. I, I wasted probably two weeks on one problem because a tool was wrong and told me that one instruction was wrong when it was perfectly fine and the next instruction was broken and it neglected to inform me of that. So having bad tools is, is often uh, more of a hindrance than it is a help. And so as a result of that experience, I made sure that we were going to have exhaustive testing of, of this validator because I never want it to be wrong. Um, so today, it runs and it validates the assembly that our compiler generates in debug builds. And also, if you use this environment variable to print the assembly, when you set that to FS, it will, for instance, print out the fragment shader assembly. If that, uh, that program contains some sort of validation error, it'll just tell you. It just prints it out right after the instruction in some human readable form. Um, really, really simplifies things. So in this case, you know, we can see that this, this width parameter is 16, and what that means is, you know, read 16 components before you, you stride vertically, but the operation itself is only operating on eight components, so it, it's nonsense. Um, another interesting thing is that we haven't really had a good story for debugging GPU hangs for a long time. Um, the kernel will give you an error state, and, and that typically has a pointer to the last instruction in the batch that failed, and you get some information about what shader program was executing. But it wasn't until a fairly recent version of the kernel that the kernel actually saved the, the shaders. So today, when you cause a GPU hang and you get this error state, it contains all of the information that you need to debug it. And we have a very nice program in Mesa called Obinator Error Decode that, as its name would suggest, you feed the, the error state to it, it decodes it, it shows you um, the, the disassembly of the program. And, you know, these, these error states might have been generated by a release build, which just wouldn't be running the validator under normal circumstances. So in this case, if something slips through and the validator is capable of catching it, now you have a program that's just going to tell you directly, this is your problem. And in addition, if we improve the validator to check more things, 
then we can now come back and, and check old GPU hangs generated with a version of Mesa from a year ago and find the problem. So I, I hope that you have concluded from this that the 965 instruction set is, is pretty complex. I, that's certainly my opinion and I work on it professionally. Um, but I think that it's, it's manageable with some guardrails like a working validator. Um, it also offers a bunch of interesting opportunities for optimizations. I mean, the, the regioning stuff allows you to really do neat things with the data in your registers. And personally, I've found it challenging, but also very rewarding to be able to apply my knowledge of this instruction set to optimize real applications. And if you're interested, I hope this talk will enable you to do that as well. Are there any questions? So thanks for explaining the regioning. This is very interesting. Um, I was wondering um, about uh, the, the VWH. So you mm -hmm. showed only examples where those numbers were powers of two. Is that, yes. an, is that an inherent restriction? Yes, it is. They are, they are powers of two. And, and uh, what happens like if you, if you exceed the size? Does it just wrap around, I guess? Yeah. So um, one. One thing that I didn't really go over is that, for instance, um, because in a GPU with the, the SPMD programming model, the vector size is sort of determined by the hardware, whereas here it's obviously it's very explicit in the instruction, um, we actually have to generate multiple versions of the program to run on different numbers of pixels at once. And so, uh, we would, for instance, generate a program that contains a bunch of add eight instructions. And then separately, we would have one that emits 16 byte instructions. And then the GPU would determine which it executes. So those, those parameters actually allow you to do things including reading into the next register. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the model of, you know, you've got this 2D array of memory that these things allow you to access. Hmm. Interesting. And one final question, can you go back to the GLX gears shader and explain that now that we know what these suffixes all Back to the, to the which? The GLX gears shader, the first oh, one sure. you showed. Yeah. So aggravatingly, um, and I, I told you there are lots of restrictions and, and weird warts, the, the plain instruction, I believe it's this argument, it actually reads like four registers worth of data, which is not, not what you would expect from this region. It's just some irritating requirement from the hardware docs that say that you have to program this with this region and it, it's going to do something entirely different. Um, but yeah, typically this would be, you know, read a, a, a single component. And actually I might be wrong. I think it's this one that reads uh, multiple registers. Yeah, I think it is because this is G2 and this is G, well, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, but anyway, this would typically read just a single component and this would read uh, eight of them. Hi, so I have a question regarding the uh, validation, uh, which is whether there is any integration at all uh, with the CI system, because I've seen some cases where uh, we had shaders that were actually triggering validation issues, but you know maybe we were testing that with things that work anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the problems would show up later. So I was wondering if it's possible to somehow integrate that with the CI system, so the CI system could tell you, you know, right. I didn't detect the fail, but you know you have a problem anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been my experience that. Sometimes when you violate these, these restrictions as stated in the docs, that it doesn't hang immediately, but it might hang in the next shader program because it, it presumably messes up some internal hardware state or something. Um, so I, I've sort of taken the approach of trying to follow the spec to its letter so that we don't ever run afoul of that. 
Um, at the same time, we definitely do know of cases where the hardware documentation says something isn't legal, and it actually is. It actually is because they just didn't consider this is a, a valid thing to ever do. Like for instance, the, um, with a conditional mod, if you test for less than zero, the hardware, all it's going to do is test the high bit to see if it's, if it's negative or not. And so the, the XOR instruction has a documented note that says you can't test for less than zero. You can only test for, uh, for, for zero or non-zero. But it doesn't actually have to do any arithmetic. All it has to do is read that bit. And so empirically, we've determined that that's, that's perfectly legal. It's just a, it's really a documentation bug. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, one of my questions was um, whether it is possible for the Intel CI system uh, to find um, um, validation issues in the tests. Like ah, if I push I a patch, it has happened to me right. that everything seemed to work, mm -hmm. but then I found out that I had actually validation issues. Uh, uh, and somehow, because everything worked, you know, the patch went through, but if, I, if, if Jenkins had told me, hey, things are, pass things are passing, but there is actually right. a, pro a validation problem here, so you should really uh, check what you're doing. Uh, so I was wondering if it is possible to integrate the validation output with Jenkins in yeah. a way that's... Yeah, in, in fact, um, when we run things through the CI, as far as I know, they are debug builds. Clayton, yeah, Clayton confirms. So the, the validator should be running for, for every test in Jenkins. Um, the, the one thing about it that I, that I would like to change is that currently, if you don't specify that Intel debug environment variable, uh, the only information that you get when a test fails is you get an assertion failure saying, you know, validated was false. And so it doesn't actually print the error message. Um, so we could probably wire something up so that it actually printed out the disassembly when it, when it fails in that way. Um, another thing I think I heard Mark say was that, the, uh, that he has plans to provide the GPU error state as just a, a downloadable object from your, your Jenkins. Um, and so with that, you should be able to just take that and, and pass it into Obinator error decode and, and get the same information. So when we trigger a CI jobs, uh, is this happening automatically for everyone? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, right. Yep. Any other question? What do you get from the validator that you wouldn't get from running the programs in a software model of the GPU? Is it faster or is it, um, are there actual classes of bugs that you um, would otherwise miss? Sorry, is the, is the question why, uh, what is, why are we executing the program on, on vectors? Um, why write the validator versus a software model of the GPU instead? I see. Um, the, the implementation of the, the execution unit, which is the name for the, the little core that executes these programs, would be a pretty significant amount of work, I think. Um, there is actually a, a project to sort of do that. It's, it's created by Christian Hoegsberg. Um, he calls it KSIM, which as far as I know stands for Christian Simulator. And he actually generates AVX2 instructions directly. Um, so something like that is, is doable. But even there, if you are you know, violating some restriction, if you're emitting an instruction that, that doesn't really make sense, I guess you would, you'd have to detect it before you emit the equivalent code. So in that way, you're, you have to implement the validator just the same. I see, thank you. Um, do you actually always use the whole 128 register file for one shader? Uh, no, fortunately not. And, and that's actually an interesting point. So another difference is that, uh, another difference between Intel GPUs and, 
others are that the, the parallelism that you get, say on an NVIDIA, is determined by um, the, the number of registers that you use because that's a, that's a limiting factor. So for instance, if you only use 16, you would maybe be able to get four times the parallelism as if you use 64. Um, the design of this GPU for the last uh, maybe eight years has been one where you get a fixed number of registers regardless of the number that you use. And so it, it, from a compiler's perspective, it sort of simplifies that problem, but probably at, at some performance cost. Or die size. Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, uh, 128, 256-bit registers is four kilobytes. And so multiply that by, uh, I think there's like seven of those per EU and then, you know, maybe 70 EUs. That's a lot of dice space. Um, one question. Um, when, when you run the... Uh the error code to the uh, Arbinator, uh, um, how, uh, how does the output look like and uh, what kind of information does it give you as far as to tell you, uh, you know, what, what the problem was with the uh, GPU hang? Sure, so it, it provides a lot of information um, that it, it extracts from the batch. So you, uh, when you're programming the GPU, you upload a bunch of various state that um, then you have a batch buffer that contains a bunch of commands that points to that state. So in the batch buffer, you'll have a command that is named 3D state PS. And in that, that provides some information about the, the, the fragment shader, the, the pixel shader. Um, it has a pointer to it. It has some information about, you know, is it running under 78 mode or 7016? And through that pointer, the kernel is able to capture the the, the shader that we're then able to disassemble. So um, it has the batch, it has a bunch of the indirect state, it also has some information like the last, uh, the last command executed in the batch, and so that's what's really useful for determining which program executed, because usually the structure is something like you program a bunch of state, you do a, a 3D state PS to load your, your program, and then there's some command that tells the GPU okay, you're ready, go and do it. And, and so that will, that, uh, the error state will say, you know, the GPU hung when it did that command. And so then you can look back and find the, the last program that executed. Any other question? Okay, this is all. Thank you very much, Matt.